uh, my institute's climate policy initiative. So what we do, we are a nonprofit think tank, research think tank, and we look ex post at policies, uh, energy and climate policies that are working or that are not working. So we do try to gather uh, empirical evidence in order to understand what we can learn from the wide range of policies that are out there going beyond the carbon market. So having the ETS of one of the instruments that we see there. And uh, what I've been asked to do today is kind of start off the discussion with a broader picture, of kind of showing where the carbon markets are in the overall flow of climate finance, as we call it, in the overall uh, support to uh, implement um, uh, energy and, and climate policies uh, in the global, on the global scale. And so I'm going to start off with some more bigger numbers and then try to come back to introduce you, to give you an introduction, an overview of the EU ETS, where we are now, what is it, what is the, the early lessons, the achievements that we can identify and then kind of start putting some of the questions and then kind of setting up the discussions that we will have later with the panel and with all of you. So what we think is really important to understand is what's the type and the magnitude of support that is being made available to address climate change and, and how this kind of the support is matching the needs of countries and also how uh, effective the, the support is in actually addressing some of the overall goals. And for this purpose, uh, what we did is um, last year, and this is a very complicated picture here, we call it our spaghetti diagram, not only because we're based in Venice, but that obviously is one of the reasons. What we did last year is kind of providing an overall overview of what are the climate finance flows that are currently uh, out there on a global scale and how finance is flowing from the sources, from carbon markets, carbon taxes, uh, tax revenues, offset markets, the private, obviously very important, the global capital markets, through the intermediaries, which are public and private banks or agencies, through the instruments that are being applied, ranging from um, offset flows, but grants, loans, the different types of instruments to the actual end users, really both the technologies and also the, the different countries and the really sectors where the money is going to. And the idea is, is really to get an overall understanding of how much money is currently being spent on climate change and addressing uh, both adaptation and mitigation in order to understand what is working and where do we see gaps and where do we see additional need for action. And what we find here in, in this last year's uh, first study is that on average 97 billion US dollars are currently being spent uh, on uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation and this is for 2009, 2010 numbers. And we're currently updating these numbers, but uh, I do want to use this broader framework of understanding what's this, as we call it, the landscape of climate finance to show you a little bit the role of carbon markets and then also the role of the EU ETS in this context. So some of the key findings of this kind of uh, landscaping exercise that we've done is, first, uh, obviously we do all know that in order to achieve the broader climate change goals, we need significant investments, and really significant investments. What we see in the good news from the work that we've done is that money is flowing, but what we also know is that it's still far, far short of what is actually needed in the global context, so far, falls far short of the global financing needs. Um, there are some interesting uh, new insights coming from an update that we're currently doing on the really the importance of domestic flows. And I think, again, there you can learn a lot both within Europe but also in other emerging economies. Uh, but as I said, in, in general, also in general, uh, the good news is that there is some money. What we also see is that in order to address the overall uh, the need to, for an upscale of investments, uh, the public sector uh, is not, uh, alone cannot kind of address this problem. So the public sector alone cannot finance the transition that we need in order to achieve our goals. And we see that private capital certainly is essential to, to kind of get us on a low carbon climate resilient pathway. And in this context, however, we have seen the importance again of the public sector standing behind the private flows in, term, in, in form of, of policy frameworks of the right policy instruments and also in terms of other types of kind of uh, uh, subsidies that are giving in the beginning in order to, to bridge the gap to some kind of, uh, when there is kind of uneconomic technologies out there. We've also seen that it's really important to learn from the actors in the market. And again, what we've seen here, that there is agencies and banks involved 
in delivering the finance that have really a special knowledge of what is going on on the ground in the market. And this is really essential to unlock some of the investments that are needed in order to get us to scale. Finally, just in terms of the overall kind of the information that we have, and that's also something in the context of the UTS, which has always been critical, is that there is in general you know, better information of what is the climate finance uh, on, on a global scale, but we still have significant reporting gaps that hinder a good understanding of what is the scale and the magnitude and the nature of flows that are out there. So let me now put that a little bit in context of, of the carbon markets. And I think here uh, in the short term, what we see is that out of the 97 billion average US dollars that are currently being provided, carbon markets play only a very tiny little role. So on average, it's just about 2 billion out of the 97 that are currently being provided through carbon markets. And that obviously stands uh, quite at odds with the high ambitions that we had when Kyoto Protocol was, uh, was being signed. Within this picture, however, we can see that there is improvement. And this, this year's update actually shows that the carbon market is increasing a little bit in importance. We can also see that the UHS remains the engine of, of, of the kind of overall a carbon market also by sharing the lessons with other emerging uh, carbon markets. We can also see from the landscape what is needed is certainly that we put a price in carbon. This has just been said before, and as I said, the UHS is certainly an excellent kind of laboratory to share some of the lessons and the new achievements. We have a number of experiments around the world where you try to test some of these lessons in a very specific context and apply it to a very specific uh, national circumstances. Uh, but we also see at the moment we do have a fragmented carbon market, so we don't have a global carbon market in sight in the short term. If you look at that, then in the longer term, um, and again, I do want to stress it very strongly, is this 97 billion is important because it shows that money is being spent on climate change. But if you put it into perspective of what's needed, it is just a little tiny drop, and you really need to upscale that significantly in order to, to get us on a long, uh, low carbon climate resilient pathway. And so here first, I do want to make the point that this 97 billion should not be compared to the 100 billion that is currently being uh, discussed uh, in the international negotiations. These are different types of definitions. We really look at everything which is out there. We don't look if it's necessarily additional or whether it's only north south. This is really an overall, you know, an overall picture of what is currently being spent. But as I said, even more importantly, if you look at what are the overall infrastructure investments, not only kind of climate related, but the overall infrastructure investments in the world. We have the, um, the World Economic Outlook database of the IMF that project, projects that by 2015 you need about 10 trillion US dollars for uh, annual investments in developing countries. And in order to make those green or sustainable, probably need another 500 billion US dollars. And that just shows you the scale of the problem and what really is needed in order to get us there. And certainly, uh, we all know that in order to get us there, we do need a stronger carbon price signal. However, this being transmitted by the carbon price is an essential element to get us to an upscale of these numbers. So let me get you know to the ETS, finally. But I do think it is important to have this broader picture, the framework. And I won't go into detail. I know here the audience Everyone will know what the ETS is about. It's the, it's the largest market for greenhouse gas emissions in the world. It is what I think needs to be stressed every time. It's a true multinational system. We do have 27 sovereign member states that are uh, within this system and can therefore provide very important lessons due to this uh, uh, structure. We do have links to non-European uh, Union, uh, European countries like Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, and we have this linking directive that provides this link to the global, um, global um, carbon market. The phased approach is also something which I do want to stress is an important element of the, of the um, overall ETS. I do think it has shown that we can learn in phases, and like it is important to learn lessons as we go ahead and have the possibility to feed the lessons into the evolving structure of a policy instrument. So I think the pilot phase that we've had, where we've learned lots of lessons that then have feed inside the, fed inside the overall restructuring of the ETS has been really important. So again, here, this is just to give a kind of the overall picture where we are. The ETS has obviously been designed in, in, in light of the overall broader 
European uh, policy objectives and also of the overall international kind of policy objectives, objectives that are out there. The main features of the UETS, it is a classic cap and trade system. So we, we have a classic, a classic kind of trading scheme that has been uh, put in place. But what is different from the kind of the classic approach that is implemented highly decentralized, so which is again something uh, which can provide lessons for other kind of emerging systems. We're covering electric utilities and heavy industry. We have aviation from 2012. Uh, and the sequential multi-year period with the declining cap, I think, is something which is really a very uh, promising feature and shows, again, that you are uh, uh, kind of incorporating the lessons from the early phase into the evolving policy design of the ETS. Um, obviously, a big question here is always whether the kind of the declining cap is something which has a credibility in the, overall, in the overall kind of framework of the ETS, so whether people really believe that this is something which is going to, to happen over time. There is the use of offsets, again, to, current, to, to use more flexibility and really have it as a kind of a, um, a typical and classical uh, market-based instrument. It's allowed up to 13% of the emissions, currently only from CDM and GI, GI mechanisms, but this obviously is also one of the discussion points. And also, again, learning from the early experiences that the principle for the distribution of allowances is evolving into full auctioning over time. But again, this is still quite a long way probably to go, but it is, ex again, something where we can learn from the early lessons. This all here is kind of just um, reflecting what I just said, the overall picture of the emission, uh, the emissions and the caps as there are currently. So you can see the black bold line is actually the, the actual ETS emissions as we have them. You can see that after introduction of the, uh, of the pilot phase of the ETS, there has been a decrease in emissions from various factors, but certainly you can see that the emissions have also decreased um, as compared to the counterfactual emissions, which we did actually a study and tried to understand what would have happened without the ETS. And so you can see that there has been a change. And you can see here, um, obviously, the different, the declining cap over time as we go ahead, uh, if everything is kind of staying as it is at the moment. And I'm sure we'll have discussions about that later on. Before kind of concluding with some questions, I do want to make a few uh, lessons or surprises as we had them uh, when kind of studying the ETS in the first phases. I think the first surprise that we've had is that we have actually found in the pilot phase already when there was a very modest cap and actually read really ambition may mostly to learn lessons on where it's, whether it's working and what is working, you've actually seen that there was a abatement in the pilot phase. So we have seen that due to a number of reasons, a significant carbon price in the first half of the, of the pilot phase, rising GDP still and, and also rising output in the ETS sectors and also other, price, uh, other factors like weather and, and relative prices in fossil fuels and, and have led to a situation where we did have, as you've seen on the previous graph, actually lower emissions than the counterfactual. Obviously, there might be other reasons as well, but the CO2 price is a very likely explanation for this. And while it was kind of a modest abatement, I still want to stress that this is important just to show that a carbon price can set the right signals and can actually stimulate uh, behavioral changes in, uh, in, uh, throughout kind of the, the actors. And I think another point I want to make here is just to keep in mind whenever you see the large surpluses and the large numbers and the surpluses of allowances, that a long position per se is not an indicator of overallocation. Abatement is also reducing the overall need for allowances. So there are a number of factors that need to be taken into account before making a judgment of whether the, the, the kind of overall number of surplus of, of allowances actually can can tell you whether there have been only overlocation or whether there have been several behavioral changes as actually uh, would be the objective from the ETS itself. I think the second surprise that we've had again is, is related to offset use, where we've had lots of discussions on how much, you know, what should be the quantity of offsets allowed in the system. And uh, while we've had only a couple of, of years of observations, and this is based on a paper by Daniel Lamand and Raphael Trottignon, you've seen that actually only 4% of the ETS emissions were covered by, by offsets. And uh, if you look again, it's only used by about 20% of the installations, mainly among industrials. 
And we can also see that if you look at what, what is the type of offsets that, where is, are the offsets coming from, it's very similar to the kind of the, the big suppliers. So it's in line with where the supply is coming from, which is China, mostly China, India, and some other countries like South Korea. Brazil. And again, this is just to, again, you know, you know, it makes sense to take a step back, look at the available empirical evidence and try to understand whether we are actually just talking about the threat of offsets or whether we actually are using and what their incentives are in the system itself. And the third surprise I, I just want to mention here is certainly related to economic effects, which was a big discussion, particularly in the beginning of the design of the ETS. In Europe here, there were great fears of macroeconomic and trade effects. And uh, what we've seen, again, from, from the kind of empirical evidence, that we've looked at it, and Neil obviously is here, has done an excellent work on this as well. We, we have had actually no really chance to detect any real effects uh, in this context. So we've had, uh, we've, what we've seen also is that it actually is really just one price amongst many. And so it does have, it might have obviously a different impact if carbon prices were higher or will become higher in, in the future. But still, we do have now several years of experience here. And you can see that people are actually using, like kind of considering the CO2 price just as one additional price factor to be considered in making the business decisions. So let me stop with a few early lessons. Again, some of them I've already said. I do think the pilot phase that we've had here was extremely important. It helped to build the kind of infrastructure and, and, and also the experience that then could be fed into the kind of evolving design of the ETS. And also, certainly it also showed the importance of data and the importance of, of kind of credible data behind uh, such the design of such a system. As I said, the limited impact so far on competitiveness that might change over time, but still it is important also to share with, with the emerging uh, uh, systems in other countries. Also seen, it's been a major driver of the global carbon market. Still, without the ETS, uh, we probably would have a quite different situation of the, of the global carbon markets and the international kind of offset trades that are out there. And in addition, I think the most important point I do want to make is that we do have a real carbon price now. Yeah, this, it's not as high as we have thought, but we have a, a real carbon price that covers about 10% of the global uh, emissions today. And it has actually induced as I said before, uh, abatement. It's still modest, but this is also because of the changing framework conditions that we're in and what has happened over the last years. But it gives a signal for investment and innovation, and it is modest, but it takes time also for a carbon price to sink in and actually for investments to bear fruit. What is also important, I think, is, is that we do have a mechanism in place for achieving further greenhouse gas emission reductions. We've had the ETS is certainly a, a a perfect example of where you're learning the lessons and continuing to kind of improve the overall design. And I think having something like the UHS in place in a region like Europe is amazing. It gives us really a, a head um, start on kind of having a very good future mechanisms for reducing um, emissions over the next decades as is needed. And it's certainly much more than any other country or region has done. It's something to keep in mind. This has been a big policy experiment. And finally, it is a laboratory for the other systems and for a multinational system, of course. So we all know the recession, and I really want to emphasize here the recession, not other factors. The kind of the, the factors around the ETS actually have changed and have created this EU ETS crisis. While I do think that also if you look at the design as it has evolved over time, that actually the policy design was ready to, 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 to kind of provide a good signal, it being kind of the circumstances that have changed. So we need to obviously need to take that into account when now thinking about fixes, whether they're needed or what is needed. And so we're next, um, I think just to make the point again, we need a price signal if we want to address the overall challenge that we have um, ahead of us. We need to internalize the CO2 costs. Market instruments are important, they are essential. I, I do agree that there is other instruments out there as well, and certainly the ETS is not, as we've seen also, is not adequate for all sectors or all types of gases. So there are, you will need a combination of instruments, but ETS certainly has proven to, to be a, a key, uh, key instrument in order to address this challenge. We see slow process, but there is progress. I, I want to stress again, we do have a carbon price signal that industrial players are actually now taking into account industrial and energy 
utilities obviously are taking into account. Uh, we do see on the international scale some signals for a stronger uh, global carbon greenhouse gas markets. I put a question mark because I'm not yet sure how, far, how quick that will actually develop, but there are certainly signals from the different regions like China and, and Brazil that there are serious uh, efforts there ongoing in order to kind of learn the lessons from the ETS and kind of test them in a different context and over time maybe also link them as we've seen with the Australian ETS where we have this very recent news that there will be a link between Australia's and Europe's emissions training system. And so the final point here, uh, we certainly need to think about how we can strengthen the ETS, but I think we really need still to understand what is happening. I, I don't think that we know yet uh, fully perfectly what is happening in the market. I, I, we all know the ETS, one of the also kind of, I say, characteristics and advantages of the ETS is that it is a cyclic instrument. So when there is a crisis, the prices fall, which is something which should help players in the market in order to address, you know, in addition to the recession, also the kind of the, the difficulties with high carbon prices. Obviously, we've now come to a situation where we, we, we have kind of a, a serious difficulty with the prices, but I still think we need to understand how we can address what's happening at the moment. We have not yet understood perfectly what's going on with the so-called banking in the market. Uh, I, I do think that there are actually lots of signals that lots of the current allowances are being banked for the future as well, and we've had some uh, anecdotal evidence of that, but we do need to have some better empirical understanding of what is actually going on. We've seen a little bit in the past, but uh, I just didn't want to stress that before we think about how we can change everything again, we need to understand what's happening and we need to see whether the instrument that we have in place actually needs to be significantly changed or whether we just need to understand how we can actually strengthen the positive sides of it and really make it come back and get us uh, on the pathway of a higher carbon price, obviously, that then will address the overall kind of need for a transition to a low carbon and climate resilient future. With that, I'm going to look, I'm really looking forward to the discussions here and seeing what will be the solutions, what are the solutions, but I really just want to stress again, let's understand what's really happening and let's really look at the data that's out there before we make any decisions that, that would, again, also hurt some of the confidence of the players in the market. Thank you.